This is Ultimate General Civil War on Legendary Difficulty. This is Crampton's Gap, and I get just short of three to one, and I'm showing you how I build uh, my army. And what's interesting here, the reason I'm showing you this, is I put a perk in, um, or I put my perks in, and then I change my mind. I do a quick calculation, and I want to get uh, the Iron Brigade into 1st Division of 1st Corps, and so I have seven units in 1st Division of 1st Corps, and you can only do that if you have the right number of perks in Army Organization. So I do a quick calculation, reload, and uh, change where I put my perks. Now I move around uh, my units and my officers um, to get my army ready, and you can watch how I do that. I'm going to take everything to 1800. Crampton's Gap uh, can be a bit bloody and uh, costly. And um, one of the things that's interesting about Crampton's Gap, and I'm starting to get a feel for this, is just how OP the, um, the skirmisher units are. These three-star skirmisher units, they are the best melee units on the battlefield. And uh, one of the things that I've started to do is I've started to realize that if you want the if you want those really OP units out of the way, what you do is you launch an attack someplace on the battlefield where you want those units to go. Because it seems that the skirmisher units will respond to wherever you attack. So in this battle, I'm going to attack on the left to get the skirmisher units to move to his right, my left. Because my main attack, I want it to take place on the enemy's left, my right. And it works. The, the skirmisher units that I know are on the left move to the right to counter my attack. And my, then when I send my flanking maneuver around the enemy flank, it works. Uh, I'm able to get around the enemy flank, get up on the high ground, and outflank the enemy. And this leads me to something I've been thinking about. Um, I think even on Legendary, but, but on... On levels of difficulty less than legendary, it's even more obvious. But on legendary, there's an illusion of the game being more difficult than it is. And the illusion is because of the huge charge bonus that the enemy gets at the start of every phase. So it seems like there's desperate fighting. And the other thing is that every battle you fight, you start off with a small force and you're really outnumbered. And so you have this sense of urgency that I've got to get these reinforcements in and it's a desperate struggle. But here's what I've noticed over time, and I think Second Bull Run highlighted this for me, is that when your army is fully deployed on the battlefield, it can't be close. It, there's no way it can be close. And, and the reason it can't be close is because the enemy cannot think strategically. Now the devs have said when asked about this, um, how do you win these battles when all the enemy units are three stars and so tough and so on? And, and they said, better tactics. And it's more than that, though. The, the AI can bring together a bunch of infantry units and attack your infantry. And because they get a charge bonus, it's always intense. But what they can't do is what humans can do. And what humans can do is what I'm doing right here and what I did in Second Bull Run, is I'm, I attacked on the left to get the enemy's attention and then outflank him uh, with a movement to my right. And, and it, at Second Bull Run, what you noticed, uh, I hope, is that I took um, Second Bull Run historically, uh, Stonewall Jackson dug in, and the North attacked him. Longstreet came in on the flank, deployed an entire corps on the Union flank, and then crushed the Union flank. Well, what happened, and Spectrum mentioned this, uh, I did just the reverse. I took up defensive positions, the enemy attacked, and then I moved uh, an entire corps, maybe more, uh, all that cav and all that infantry on their right flank, the enemy right flank, and then, my entire corps um, that I deployed over there 
uh, fell on the enemy flank, while in the center, in my right, I just made put up an infantry line with a, piles of artillery and lots of snipers, and as the enemy attacked, he just got slaughtered. So it was basically what happened historically, but in reverse. When I was thinking about it, the AI is not capable of doing what we're doing, which is thinking strategically. And the other thing is, we can take um, a significant portion of our army and concentrate it on a portion of his army and destroy his army one section at a time. We can do things like concentrated fire, um, destroy the enemy in detail, destroy a section, concentrate all our fire on a couple of units. I, I've taken um, three divisions and attacked a single infantry unit to, to break it before uh, because it was the crucial part of the battlefield. Um, you can take, like, we think in terms sometimes of, I can take an artillery unit and put it on the enemy flank. Well, we can take 20 artillery units and put it on the flank of the entire enemy force. And the, the AI is just not capable of thinking in those terms. He can't do it, but we can. So we have an enormous advantage. The other thing we can do is simple things like, I have had a, several battles where I've taken all of my Union artillery, not just two or three hours in game, and just sit and kill all of his artillery. The AI can't think in those terms, can't do it. Um, the AI sees what's in front of him, and he attacks it. That's the limit of what he can do. Now, it's a really good AI, and it plays very much like a human player, and it fights like a lot of generals have in history. But if you want to beat it, you can if you think in terms of um, getting a superior position. Um, there are a whole bunch of battles that I fight in Ultimate General Civil War, where early in the battle I look at it, and I might even say it out loud, uh, this battle's over right now. And it, sometimes it's really early in the battle. And the reason is the enemy position is hopeless. There, there's a moment in time where the enemy position is just lost. And it doesn't matter that the enemy has all three-star units and I'm fighting him with one-star units. It doesn't matter. The position the enemy has is hopeless, and it would take a really, really good human opponent with a lot of skill to be able to salvage that position. And in some cases, there's nothing the enemy could do. So, yeah, it's... Like, this position on the enemy left right now, it's pretty hopeless right now. That position, that flank is going to collapse. There's way too much force there. And when that the enemy left flank collapses, my army is going to have the high ground, and the enemy is going to have the low ground. I don't know how he wins this battle. It's, it's the, the only hope that a human player would have at this point is to take your entire force and because you're in the, you have a central position, and either attack, everybody attacks north or everybody attacks south, one or the other, and destroy the enemy in detail. But you're going to lose that flag uh, and probably lose the battle. So, yeah, I would prefer not to attack uphill. So, yeah. So, the, the trick to this battle, I do end up getting them all. It's almost 10,000 of the enemy taken out. Um... I do end up getting them all, and this is one of those battles where you only get time to kill all of them if you don't trip the flag. Again, that's something we can do as a human player that the AI can't. Um, of course, the AI doesn't need to think in terms about the campaign because the AI isn't playing a campaign. The AI is just responding to whatever you do in the moment. So anyway, these were the thoughts that I had. Is, is um, looking at the last battle, looking at this one, like right now my troops are all on the high ground in good cover, and I want the enemy to attack me here. And I think at this point um, I should give the enemy more time to destroy himself, more time than I give him, uh, but instead I kind of push him into the woods, and unlike other levels of difficulty, just because he's surrounded it, um, and in the woods he's not going to break. Um, he can stand and fight completely surrounded for a very long period of time on Legendary. So 
you know, that's something that's very different. The other thing is he has um, he has a skirmisher unit here that um, needs to get a medal. Uh, this guy fights through one of my infantry units, uh, gets into the rear of my army, fights through an artillery unit, um, absolutely refuses to die. I think I have to um, move an entire infantry unit over to uh, corner him. But uh, yeah, the, these detached skirmisher, not detached skirmishers, uh, these skirmisher units uh, that the enemy has um, are really OP. And yeah, there, there's just, um, they, on legendary, they have to be dealt with um, as just very, very powerful units. The melee cav units used to be that way too at one time. They used to be OP, but they were dialed back. And, you know, you could make an argument that 24-pound howitzers are a little too powerful. But um, on this level of difficulty, the skirmishers are not just a little bit OP. They're a whole lot OP. Like, they're two or three times more powerful than they should be. And there's no way they should be eager for melee. I mean, the whole point of the, these guys should be like um, sniper units or... Um, skirmisher units as they existed or sharpshooter units as they existed historically they, they certainly were not eager to get in the melee with anybody they're, they're, they were tiny units that sat back and took shots at the enemy trying to kill uh, valuable targets so particularly commanders so yeah this th these units uh, on legendary are unrealistically tough So yeah, I think I'm pretty close to tripping the flag at a, a few points here, but fortunately the flag, I don't trip the flag. So this should be a one position, but uh, the enemy is very, very content just to fight in these woods until the end of the battle, and it's not easy to dig him out of here. Another thing that... Um, I just happened to, to think about is uh, between here, actually after Antietam, during the Battle of Antietam and after Antietam, the kill ratios go really up. And I think that's more a function of me adapting to legendary difficulty than uh, my units getting stronger. My units do get stronger. I get a lot more really good artillery, but as I look at how I'm fighting here, it's different than how I fight, say, at uh, Siege of Suffolk. Um, and it is a matter of adapting to legendary difficulty. And for example, when I was here fighting this, I kept thinking, these enemy units in the woods should break. Well, they're not going to break. I mean, to get these guys to break, you have to I mean, it's, it's not like Major General, or certainly not like Brigadier General. These units in these woods, um, and, and this is really highlighted for me at Antietam, and I've mentioned this instance before, where I have 24-pound howitzers firing canister into units, and the units in the woods are just not phased at all. They just, they just shrug it off. Even on Major General, that would rout a unit. But these guys in the woods right here, I have the high ground, I have 24-pound howitzers firing at them. They're not going to break. And, well, they do eventually if you pound them enough, but you have to really inflict a lot of damage on these units, um, and they're not going to give it up easily. Um, they're going to fight really hard. So, yeah, notice my 24-pound howitzer just keeps hitting that guy uh, in the at the northmost position, and... He's not going anywhere. Um, now, part of it is that my infantry unit, I think, was blocked. So that didn't help. But still, two infantry units and a 24-pound howitzer hitting this guy. He's, he, he's just standing there. And, you know, it takes a lot of shots and a lot of canister to get that guy to flash white. So, yeah, this is just how it goes. And the other thing is you want to have detached skirmishers behind your infantry so the enemy retreats in the right direction. 
because you cannot have these three-star units retreat into your line. That's just a complete disaster. So, yeah, you have to control the retreat direction of the enemy. Like, look at this guy. Look at this guy. So, he's way under strength. He's getting, um, yeah. He just walks through my line. Oh, it's an it's infantry unit. He just walks through my line. Now he's going to walk th through my artillery. Uh, get into melee. Yep, that's... If I'd had a detached... And I thought about this just like a second too late. If I'd had a detached skirmisher behind my line... Um, because artillery doesn't count in the enemy's calculation. So if I'd had a detached skirmisher behind my line, the enemy w would have retreated to the south. But what he's doing is he's looking at all of my infantry units all around his position and trying to retreat in a place where there's... I don't have any units. And the fewest, you know, the path of least resistance is north out of this pocket. So another unit is now retreating north out of the pocket. So, yeah, that's, um, I needed some detached skirmishers to channel the enemy's retreat. So now I have to bring an infantry unit, have him go up the hill and take care of this mess as the uh, enemy infantry is retreated to the north. I've gotten really used to this. And uh, one of the things that I do to handle this on Legendary is I have built a lot of rifled cav. And that has proven to be really, really powerful. The rifle cav can run down these units. Um, dismount, dismounted rifle cav is incredible. Uh, chase enemy units into the corner of the map and then just blast away until the enemy is dead. So basically what that technique means is that um, any units that retreat, even like this, uh, any solitary units that retreat away from the rest of their army dies. So uh, in a grand battle that infantry unit and the skirmisher who retreated would just be hunted down and killed. And I'm not even talking about getting them into melee, just having your cav dismount and fire into these guys. These isolated units will easily take them out at almost no loss. So here is entire force when it finally retreated, retreated uh, northeast, which is where I did not want them to go. And I can't just go after him, I'll trip the flag. So what I do is I have my entire army pick up and now go back north and around and not trip the flag and we'll, we'll wipe them out. The guys who retreated south are going to be easily taken out. Finally, the unit in the northwest is taken out. And yeah, he actually has three units over here. I should have paid more attention to the red bar. He has two units that are annoying right here that I can see, but he has a third unit that I'm about to stumble on. Um, actually, he might have a fourth unit over there hidden. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I have to mobilize my entire army and go get him. And, uh, yeah. Now, the battle after this, South Mountain, pretty straightforward. I simply put, uh, uh, what I found is putting raw recruits into my army works. It's it's very effective. Um, the army I go into Antietam with is more than adequate. I have a really good time and get a good result at Antietam. And the army coming out of Antietam is, is in really good shape. And, uh, yeah, so... Um, this campaign is actually going better than I think it is at this point because everything that's happening is pretty good. At Antietam, I think I had a lot of two-star units, and by Chancellorsville, I had two and three-star units. I'm finding that my one-star units are more than adequate um, for everything we're doing here. I just have to be more creative with my tactics, I guess, and maybe a little more patient than I normally am, and we're still going to get good results. So... I think this might be the only battle where I don't get 3 to 1. But I'm happy with this result. I'm happy because my goal is to get all of the enemy and um, 
We're going to get increasingly good kill ratios as we go forward. I'm happy with the um, almost 3 to 1 that we get here, because my goal was to get all of them. And I'm really quite surprised, uh, particularly by the time Antietam rolls around, the number of kills that we get. Um, the number of kills starts to go through the roof. Um, I've never had numbers, I don't think. And, and about Antietam and after, the results that I get are better than what I got on Major General. Uh, part of that is the enemy army is larger, so there's more to kill. But um, in some cases, I'm taking... I'm killing a lot more of the enemy and taking fewer casualties than I did on Major General. And, um, yeah. So, here we are. I'm very happy. I was very happy with this result when I got it. I'm sure I could have reduced my casualties a bit, but uh, I was happy with this. Um, want to drive down the enemy numbers, want to, you know, keep his training level down and um, keep working on that. And uh, some of these units took some hits, but they're going to get raw recruits. And so what ends up happening is it's just, to me, the cost of uh, weapons. And yeah, as you're going to see, we're going to buy lots of weapons. So yeah, 60 to 65. Training level 60 to 65. That's going to go up. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna continue to go up. So um, that's gonna hurt a bit, but uh, that's okay. We're gonna deal with that. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, it turns out here I go to eight. I think I need nine by Antietam so that the Iron Brigade goes into first division. So okay, I'll see you in the next battle.